nebula cluster. Freakish phenomenon. Lines are open. This is uh, Captain James T. Kirk. Silence! I am Green Man here to judge you for chopping down all of the trees. Sir, it's overloading all of our ships. <laughs> You must face some creature in mortal combat. Clearly know this song better than I do. <laughs> I only know the first like two phrases. I think that's about it. And that's it. Good job, humans. Now you may go free since you have proven that you are peaceful because you beat up that other space alien. All right, everyone, welcome to Lecture 27 today. Uh, we're going to discuss second order bandpass responses. So this chapter, uh, chapter 29, and apologies for the formatting in the summer edition here, um, what we're going to do is look at our good old RLC circuit, and we're going to analyze it now in terms of our frequency knowledge that we've gained over the previous uh, handful of chapters. Okay, so if you want to bandpass... Uh, what band are we going to pass? We're going to pass the good bands. Then we're going to reject the bad bands. Like, I don't know, we're going to reject maybe these over here. <laughs> anyway, uh, can you tell I'm a classic rock junkie? I don't know. No, band pass just means it's the frequencies. Oops. We, uh, we want to keep. And these are just the frequencies. Uh, we want to reject. Now, typically, for like bandpass filters, what they're going to look like, and this is just a general picture, and we're going to see this in a moment, they're going to look like this, and you're going to have some frequency that you're sort of centered around, and then we're going to look at it and say, well, it has these certain characteristics and measurements to it, and it does these different things. What's really going on here is we're actually passing everything to a certain extent. Almost every filter is going to pass almost everything to a certain extent. The goal here is just to make this look as nice and clean as possible. Okay, so this is where we start is, you know, one of these slope deals and where we want to try to go as we get cleaner and cleaner for our filter designs is something that only passes very specific frequencies like this. Now, this is a very hard thing to draw with, you know, shapes that are all curvy, right? So as we progress through this, you'll see how we try to accommodate certain features so that we make sure that we get the characteristics out of our frequency responses that we want. So that's that's kind of the, you know, bird's eye view of, of what's going on here is we want to try to keep certain frequencies in and reject other frequencies. Um, sometimes you're going to have a difficulty of, you know, having to do this in multiple sections. Um or trying to, you know, make sure that you don't cut off other important pieces of information in the slopey region of your of your band pass, okay? So lots of stuff to keep in mind here. We're just starting to scratch the surface on um, how frequency responses can be tailored. And this is that first step on actually tailoring those responses, okay? For a parallel RLC, and I'm going to go ahead and draw it out even though we know what the heck it looks like. Okay, so there's our RLC circuit. We have this input impedance. We know that this input impedance is just, e or I'm sorry, admittance, excuse me. We have this input admittance and it's equal to one over RP, right? When we hit that magic frequency, when omega is equal to omega naught, which is equal to our resonance frequency. We've talked about resonance before, very important topic. 
Um, so the admittance for the circuit will achieve a minimum value here. Which means that our impedance is actually going to hit its maximum value here. Okay, so what does the uh, impedance look like? Oh, by the way, um, the parallel combination of capacitor and inductor in this at the resonance will effectively be an open circuit, right? Just keep that in mind. Um, so what do we have for Zn? Well, Zn is just this expression. We've calculated this before, so I don't feel bad just chucking it up here. And this is rather simplified, so that's... That's nice for us. And why do we write it this way? Well, the main reason we, we, we write it this way is because we want to have these, uh, these nice polynomials here, right? On top and bottom. We don't want a bunch of 1 over s's floating around all over the place. And so this is the form that we end up with. Okay, so we're gonna, we have a maximum value of our impedance and that maximum value is equal to RP at omega R. Nothing should be new here so far, okay? But we observe that this uh, transfer function, which is what this effectively is, right? This is a, just a transfer function, this impedance, uh, is qualitatively uh, presented by the following graphic, okay, right here. So effectively, this is what our magnitude of that impedance, i.e. our frequency response, should look like, okay? So let's look back at our equation real quick and look at some of the end behavior of this function, some of the characteristics that we can see. So as omega goes to omega j, however you want to write it, because right, we only care about s equal omega j, really. As this goes to zero, we have a zero up top here. So this should converge to zero as I approach zero. Yeah, that should be pretty straightforward. Zn so goes to zero. And as omega j goes to infinity, what happens here? Well, the power downstairs is larger than the power upstairs, so by basic uh, calculus rules here, this is also going to make this go to zero. Okay, so it goes to zero at both ends, this way and this way, okay? And then in the middle, it has this, this hump behavior right at our resonance uh, right there, and it's a nice smooth function. It's just one polynomial over another, so it should be relatively smooth, no, no herky-jerky behavior. Um, but there are a couple of other spots that we really care about trying to characterize. So in general, the term that we're going to use to describe a system that behaves like this, okay, or has this almost bell-shaped distribution, is this is going to be called a, this shape is called a, band pass, okay? And the reason we call it a band pass is because you can think about a range of frequencies in here, a band, if you will, in the spectrum that it is passing, and then these other regions have so little gain um, beyond here and before this point that we really say, well, these are effectively not even being represented anymore. And so really the only things that we see back out are Frequencies in, in about this, this range. Note that this is a continuous process, though, so there is no hard line in this, in this shape for a bandpass filter. Some filters are very nice, um, and they'll look, like I said, very rectangular and, and, and pull things off. But in our case, for this simple example, things are eh, kind of gradual, all right? Okay, and we're going to describe uh, it through some of these descriptive features here. Now, note that if this is a bandpass filter, right, 
Then we have two other things that immediately come to our attention. I'm just going to jump to these real quick. Um, I don't think we addressed them in your book right away, but I, I think it's a good place to kind of talk about them. If I have a characteristic that sort of behaves like this, right, and it passes stuff and then it tapers off, this would be a low-pass filter, right? And if I have something that did this, where it took out, you know, it didn't have much going on in low-end frequencies, but then it started passing everything else that was higher than that, this would be called uh, a high-pass filter, right? Because it's passing all the higher frequency, frequency values. So a band pass is something that kind of sits between a low pass and a high pass at some specific frequency. And that's why it's a really interesting uh, thing to look at, because it doesn't just have a certain point where it's like, okay, well, for all frequencies greater than this, you can go through, but if you're, you know, less than a certain amount, then, you know, get the heck out of here. Um, but effectively, what we've created in the past are some uh, low, uh, low pass filters, and I think we may have seen a high pass filter, I'm not sure. Um, but, uh, yeah, so this, this shape is more interesting here because we actually get to pick out a, uh, a bandwidth of this and we don't just have a fixed point. We actually have a point with a width attached to it. Okay. And that part of that actually is coming from our second order type of behavior a little bit. Um, so we'll see that as we move forward, um, when things start to move away from, from that, that we, um, get less interesting behavior, okay? As we get simpler systems, we get less interesting behavior, and as systems get more complex, we can get more complex uh, behavior with this and other bits and pieces that get tacked together. Okay, that's enough of that. All right, so let's talk about some of these terms, and I'm going to first just define what they are and how, how, where they exist, and then we're going to derive each one of them, okay? So the first one is HM. This is the maximum of the transfer function. This is the very peak of this uh, magnitude of the response, okay? So at some frequency, and in this case it's the resonance frequency, we get the maximum output for our transfer function. In this case, for this particular circuit, it's just equal to RP. We already described how we got about that, um, so let's move on. So omega M and this, the casing here, I'm not going to be critical of. Um, but this frequency is where we have our, our resonance effectively. We've seen this before. This is just one over LC or square root of LC, right? We've described this ad nauseum. So I'm going to move on from this one. It's just the center line. So right at here is our, this is our maximum line and it's defined at our resonance. All right, great. This is just redundant. <laughs> okay, so what about omega L and omega H? So this is the uh, lower half and this is the upper half or the higher half uh, power of the band, uh, band pass characteristic. So these guys are a little bit more tricky to define and we're going to kind of base them off of the bandwidth. So you, these are kind of all tied together. These, these concepts here. So the bandwidth is defined as the distance between these two guys. This is the width of our band that we are passing through, right? We're allowing these this range of frequencies to pass through our, our filter effectively. Okay, so not terribly well defined, but at least we see a relationship here. And then our quality factor. This one is really important. This is actually um, where we exist, our, our magnitude, or excuse me, our frequency that we're centered at divided by its bandwidth. And so what this is actually kind of referring to is with respect to its peers around it, right? So with respect to its peers around it, this frequency should have a uh, relatively large or narrow bandwidth associated with it. Is it really just picking out just this frequency or is it letting a bunch of stuff around it? Is it really loose and sloppy? Well, actually the best way to describe this is with the frequency itself. So because this is growing from zero to infinity, we need to characterize this by a scaled factor of what this is actually equal to. For example, Let's suppose that omega m is equal to 100, 
okay? Just for giggles. Um, and let's say that our band pass is relatively large. Um, let's say that it's like, I don't know, uh, if this is 100 here, let's call this uh, 50. That's going to be huge, right? So this is actually only a Q factor of, of 2. Okay, but if I had it really narrow with respect to that frequency, let's say that it was only 1, right? Then my Q factor would actually be equal to 100. Conversely, if I looked at this same 50 right here for a frequency of, let's say, uh, 5,000, then you can quickly see that my Q factor here would actually be equal to um, oh, sorry, too many zeros. <laughs> um, then my Q factor would still be equal to 100 in this case, even though I have a distribution, a width here of 50. So really that bandwidth, the, the moral of the story here is that bandwidth truly depends in its competency on what it's attached to, what frequency it's occurring at. Because without information about where the bandwidth is centered, the uh, width of the band is a useless metric. That's why we have the Q factor. Because that tells us exactly, um, with respect to where that frequency is, how useful is this, this band pass at actually um, filtering out anything around the frequency in question. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to derive here is our half power bandwidth, okay? Okay, so first we start off by setting this expression equal to what we know for the, uh, the admittance. So we have yn j omega is equal to the square root of 1 over rp squared plus omega cp minus 1 over omega lp. That's this whole quantity squared. Okay, and we want this to be equal to the square root of 2 over rp, noting here that we're taking the reciprocal for this admittance now. So in order to make this work out, we, we just do a little bit of algebra here. And if we square both sides, we end up with uh, 1 over rp squared plus omega cp minus 1 over omega lp squared is equal to 2 over rp squared. Or better yet, maybe one half of this. And we can start to see an expression emerging here. Oh, I'm sorry, this is not a one half. This is a this is two. <laughs> there we go. So we can start to see an expression emerge here if we pop this guy over to the other side. And uh, what we end up with is the following. We have one over RP squared is just equal to this squared, right? And we drop the squares. And so 1 over rp is equal to plus or minus this quantity. And so we, we take both versions, right? The plus and the minus version of this to get our plus and minus um, versions of, uh, of omega L and omega H. That should make a little bit of sense. So we break this up into two. So we have our first equation, 1 over rp is equal to omega cp minus 1 over omega lp. And our second equation is 1 over rp is equal to minus omega cp minus uh, 1 over L omega lp. Okay, so we're going to take these two equations and work with them. Okay, from here we just write a really nice expression for ourselves. We just convert these uh, into omega squared. Uh, and we're going to divide every... We're going to multiply... Oops. We're going to multiply everything by omega and divide everything by CP on top here and on bottom as it turns out. Um, but we're going to also uh, take care of the sign uh, down below as well. So anyways, we multiply by omega, divide by CP, we end up with the following. Uh, this minus 1 over RP CP 
m's omega, um, and then minus uh, one over lp cp. This is equal to zero. So for this one, I forgot. To, for this one, I forgot to draw my my little parentheses there. Sorry about that. There we are. Don't forget your parentheses, guys. They're important. Okay, so we have um, same same thing here, very similar. Uh, we're going to just multiply both sides by negative 1 to get rid of that, that business there. So this is going to be uh, similarly. So you should be able to tell by visual inspection here that uh, this one's going to generate our omega h, that higher end one, and this one's going to give us our lower end one. If you graph out these polynomials, you can kind of see that going on here as well. Um, but, eh, just know what their form is. It's not a big deal. Okay, so these are now defined for us by solving the uh, polynomial. We have omega h is just going to be equal to the square root of this big quantity here. Um, 1 over 2 rp cp squared plus 1 over lp cp. That ends the square root. And then plus 1 over 2 rp cp. Similarly, omega L is going to be equal to the square root of 1 over 2 RP CP squared plus 1 over LP CP here. And then it's going to have a minus attached to it at the end. 2 RP, whoops, RP CP. And if you had any doubts before of which one was bigger and which one was smaller, no, you don't, right? Because this has the plus and this has the minus at the end of it. Okay, we can use this to uh, calculate our band pass, which is actually really simple here, right? Because we just subtract these two. So effectively, it's just going to be two times this uh, term that's right here. So this actually defines our band pass as well, which is equal to this, which is finally just this. All right, next we're going to examine the Q factor which is actually really straightforward. The Q factor is just equal to omega m over the bandwidth. And we already know our bandwidth. We already know our omega m. So this is just 1 over the square root of LPCP over 1 over RPCP. We do a little bit of simplification here, a little bit of algebra. We end up with the following RP square root of CP over LP, which we then write as omega naught RPCP, okay? Because we know how omega naught is defined as 1 over the square root of LP, CP, etc. Okay, so pretty straightforward. Q is equal to this. So another way to write um, omega H, omega L, we can re-express them as omega M, omega M, plus the bandwidth over 2, and then minus the bandwidth over 2, which should you know, makes sense. So this is alternative form. Okay. So technically, this is a little bit of a lie right here. Um, what this actually is, is the geometric mean. And we've talked about the geometric mean before. Um, I d in the ideal, or sorry, in the to be a little bit more accurate, we can say that omega m is actually equal to um, is closer to this geometric mean omega m, omega l. But in practice, this actually works pretty darn well. And so we actually adhere to this lie pretty often. And even in the kind of stuff that I've, I've worked with, um, this is usually the way we like to think about uh, the bandwidth is having these sort of uh, symmetric sides to it because otherwise it just kind of eh, it gets a little sloppy. Um, so it's it's nicer to deal with this than it is to deal with that geometric mean. But it's there just so you know. Um, it's technically not true that it looks like this perfect little um, bell curve. It actually has some slope or some slant and uh, bias to it in some ways, I guess you could say. It looks like bias to you, but from a geometric uh, mean perspective, it has no bias. <laughs> so anyways, um, we're going to work through some MATLAB examples now. So I'm going to mark this here. I'll record the MATLAB examples in post. 
Um, so hopefully they, they line up, but I'm just going to walk through those transfer functions and then plop the, the, the walkthrough in here. Okay. Here we go. We're back at the, uh, my computer, which is trying to cook my entire house. Um, we're going to be doing the PZ Bodhi plotter thing here so that we can uh, actually graph these out for ourselves and, and prove to ourselves that everything is right and good in the world. Uh, you'll notice here that all of these have the same resonance frequency and we're just moving around like we did in that uh, resonance chapter that we did a, a little while back. And we've also merged this concept of, um, well, what we did today, which is the um, response, this bandpass response, right? Looking at different bandpasses. So we're merging these two concepts. We're just compiling and compiling everything together uh, into one big snowball as we go through. So let's take a look at this. Um, oh, so what we're going to be doing here is plotting in this transfer function. We don't have any constant factors here, so I've set the k equal to zero. And what I'm going to do for you guys is show you what this looks like from a variety of different perspectives. So we're going to look at this on a normal scale, and then we're going to look at it on a uh, on a log scale, and then we're also going to look at this in decibels and non-decibels too. Okay. So I've geared up this first one. We have a zero at zero. So make sure that if you don't have any zeros, you get rid of that. But in this case, we do. Uh, I've turned log scaling off. I've also modified the uh, script in two places now uh, to reflect just um, grabbing up the axis from zero to whatever the maximum value of omega is that we happen to grab. Um, I've tried to grab, make it work nicely so it, it gets that end behavior pretty well. Um, if it doesn't work out, let me know and I'll try to adjust the script so that it does. But basically I've turned off the, uh, the other side, the negative values of J omega so that you don't have to worry about those. In practice, you'll be looking in the, the full complex plane at some point in time. But for right now, we're just looking at the positive values of omega. So I don't see any reason for us to, um, plot the, uh, other side, which is just symmetric. Okay. That is done. Let's look at what we got. So here's our pole zero plot. No surprise here. We know what these look like pretty well by now. Um, the book actually does a nice job of outlining exactly where the resonance circles are so that you can see them. Uh, these are all scaled together nicely. So this is a great example in here. Um, but you see here that this, uh, the recoding that I did actually captures a little bit more behavior, uh, the end behavior. So in the book, it looks like uh, maybe this tapers off and takes forever to converge at some point in time is eh, sort of kind of not really um, what's actually going on here is much more explicable or explainable um, if I turn on the log scaling so let's do that now shall we whoa that is beautiful look at that isn't that a beautiful curve it's like a perfect bell curve right there and what's happening here is actually this log scale has transformed us into looking like that rich, beautiful bandpass filter that we saw um, in the book here not a couple pages ago, right? So this uh, whoop, 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 this diagram right here, and you can see this is just almost exactly what this is. And I, as a matter of fact, I think I actually pulled this uh, graphic from a MATLAB plot from, from this. So anyways, um, here's what it looks like. Nice, smooth characteristics. And you can see right here, right at 100, no kidding, this is exactly where it is. And you can almost pick up the, um, the half pass filter here too, um, or the, uh, the band pass, excuse me, from here to here. Uh, not too bad, not too bad at all. And also our, uh, our phase plot looks a lot nicer in this log scale too, I might add. So you can actually see the characteristics where the knees are in the, in the phase plot. Um, and then, uh, kind of where it is in the middle and the two convergences or where it converges to. So it starts at 90, ends at negative 90. Um, this is a fantastic graph. This is much, much nicer to work with than the other one. Okay, so let's turn the decimal scaling on now and see what we get. All right, um, so this makes sense. Uh, what this is buying for us now is something that we saw before in one of the previous chapters. So this is just a constant line up until we hit that critical point and then we come back down. What is that critical point? Um, well, actually, there are a couple, right? So we had a critical point here at zero, so things kind of take off at zero, so you can imagine that it's starting off and it's going to run, run, run until it gets to 
uh, what do we say, negative 50-ish, what do we have, negative 50 and negative 200, you can almost, almost see the two different knees here, right, there's one at 50, let me turn the log scaling off and then you'll actually see it, maybe, oh, I broke it, I broke it, yep, that one doesn't work, sorry guys, uh, someone fixed the functionality of my script. <laughs> it's not supposed to do that. Okay. Well, whatever. Um, if you zoom in here, you can actually kind of see that there's two knees to this curve. Uh, one's going to occur at about 50, and then the other one's going to occur at about uh, minus 200. Um, notice here if I had actually split these up a little bit more. All right. You're going to see this get widened quite a, quite a bit. And then you'll start to see these sort of separate out from each other here as well. So you'll see it go flat line and then come down. So effectively this uh, DB is going to just bias that uh, nice linear plotting that we know and love from before. Um, for right now, I think it's best that we, you know, we know what the, what the decibels do for us. Um, so let's stick with the, uh, the, the, the log scale and the decibels off for right now, because that's going to give us the most, most information for right now. Okay, so let's uh, go ahead and put in uh, negative 10, or I'm sorry, negative 100 and uh, negative 100. We got two, a double pull there. Notice how this has got a little little two on there, isn't that neat? That was a pain in the ass to code. Okay, holy crap, we got another beautiful plot right here. Uh, in the book, you can see that it's got this kind of weird, um, where did this go? Here we go. It's got this weird like overarch here and you're like, okay, yeah, I kind of see that's a band pass, I guess. Well, there's no doubt in your mind that this is a band pass filter anymore, is it? Because this is on a nice log scale and you can see everything and it's symmetric with respect to a log scaled frequency. Beautiful. Bellissimo. All right. Okay. Notice here it's also centered right where it should be, but our magnitude is increased. That's key. So we're increasing that magnitude when we're fiddling with those values. We still have the same resonance. We still have the same bandpass characteristics, but our magnitude is getting larger. Okay. So let's go ahead and put in minus 60 uh, plus 80J and minus 60 uh, minus 80J. Okay, so here you go. Uh, notice on the last one that the scaling factor up here was 10 to the minus 3. Uh, so anyways... Yep, pretty close to the same thing. We're still changing that uh, that magnitude there. I think we're still still growing a little bit, getting a little bit taller each time um, as we go through here. If I turn off the log scaling, you should not be surprised that it's sort of this uh, lopsided function here, but it's actually getting closer and closer to um, converging, right? Uh, it's, it's sort of getting closer and closer to just being at this 100. So you can now imagine, oops, sorry about the pull zero plot. So you can imagine that this is, as these poles are starting to move towards this axis, that it should start to become something kind of very uh, high in the Q factor. So now let's go ahead and do something that's just like really close, but not quite. Uh, minus one plus 99.5 J and minus 1 minus 99.5 J okay so that's just like almost right on that axis there uh, you can see it right here um, they're almost touching that axis but not quite and for our this is with log scaling off by the way okay so this is now all the way up at 0.5 and this is almost symmetric here, almost symmetric, because we've come so close here that we'd have to zoom in quite a lot for our behavior to even look uh, remotely strange to us. You can start to see it a little bit here, a little bit lopsided, but hardly any behavior at all that's lopsided, okay? If I turn on the log scaling, you, you really just literally see nothing still, right? It's just gotten very, very pointed. Now, if I go all the way, you can imagine what's going to happen. We're going to end up with that asymptote there. 
So if I put in minus 100, uh, minus 100J, and then plus 100J, it actually is an asymptote. You can't quite see it on this uh, graphic, unfortunately. Um, but you, uh, you should be able to get the idea here that this is open up here and uh, asymptotic. Um, and the main reason for that is when you think about the magnitude, right, you're dividing by zero when you go past this pole. And so, yep, that's what's going to happen. You divide by zero, it's going to blow up really fast. Um, so, yeah, there you go. That's, that's, our, uh, that's our band pass for these various second-order systems. All of them have the exact same resonance, but they're all behaving very different for their just passive band pass characteristics. Okay, there you go, guys. Thanks. So we had an early expression for Zn. Uh, now we're going to replace it with some of those um, nice bandpass filter terms that we just learned. And so there's two different ways to write this. Okay, so either way is just fine by me. Um, this one's nice because it has that polynomial either way you look at it from the perspective of omega m or s, which can come in very handy, by the way, if you're moving omega m around by changing your, uh, your, your different... Uh, circuit elements. So now we'll turn our attention to the series RLC bandpass characteristics. So let's draw this guy out real quick. We got a uh, input voltage here we'll call V in of T and we'll mark off our admittance right here as Y in and this guy's just going to go around like so. I've got a, a resistor here we'll call RS and then ls and then what do you know why don't we call this one just for fun cs and then i out oops this isn't capitalized yet sorry about that so this is a simple rlc circuit uh and we typically work with the input admit admittance uh so that the output of interest is the uh, current induced by the applied voltage. So, um, I apologize, there may be fireworks going off tonight as it is July 3rd today. Um, probably won't do any recording tomorrow because it's just going to be a lot of noise, uh, at least not in the evening. So anyways, um, when we look at this guy, we look at the characteristics, and what we see is that H, J, omega is effectively here just equal to this uh, input admittance, okay? And with that being said, the input admittance is going to, at this magic frequency, right, at our resonance frequency, HM is just going to be 1 over RS. From here, we can actually uh, calculate the um, characteristics pretty easily because all the equations we obtained for the parallel RLC may be translated uh, to the series case with the consideration of duality, right? Because we've kind of gone from impedance to admittance here, we can kind of just swap everything over. So Z goes to Y, R goes to 1 over R, C goes to L, uh, cats go to dogs, and uh, they're living together. Uh, the bandwidth here is just going to turn into RS over LS. Uh, recall that what we had last time uh, for bandwidth was this guy here. And so again, in the spirit of turning things into, um, into this series design, uh, we just convert that C to an L and we're in good shape and the R gets flipped over. So there we are. This is what we end up with. Um, and then our Q factor is still that same ratio. Okay. We still have Omega over, uh, the bandwidth. And so effectively what we end up with here is one over RS times the square root of LS over CS, um, noting here that we uh, account for that omega naught. Uh, if we leave the omega naught off to the side, it just looks like this. Okay, pretty straightforward, yeah? Because this is the, you know, one over BW. Yeah, so pretty easy. That's it, that's a whole, uh, that's a whole bit for the Series RLC bandpass. So, 
Not too bad, okay? So now let's look at the effects of scaling some of this stuff. So we've kind of touched on this a little bit, and one of the things to notice here is that when we scale things, um, it depends on what frequency we're at, and if we shift things in frequency, then the scaling has to be proportionate to it as well. Um, so let's, let's do some specific uh, examples. It is worth quickly observing that the frequency scaling may readily be used to move the pass band of a second order system. Consider the generic parallel RLC like we did at the beginning, uh, for which R is equal to 10 ohms, L is equal to 1 Henry, and C is equal to 1 Farad. In this simple case, we observe that the input impedance exhibits the following uh, characteristics here. We have omega original. Okay, omega not original, this is our uh, effectively our resonance here, is 1 over square root of LC. All right, and we plug in these values, we end up with just 1 times 1, which is equal to 1 radian uh, per second. Okay, uh, the bandwidth original is equal to 1 over RC, which is uh, 1 over 10 times 1, which is just 0 0.1 radians per second. Okay. And the Q factor uh, is just 1 over 0 0.1, which is 10. Notice here that the Q factor should be uh, unitless here, right? Because it's a frequency over the, the bandwidth, and the bandwidth is represented in frequency. And that makes sense too, right? Because the quality factor should be independent of where of the frequency to some extent, right? It's it's already accounted for that. It's, it's atoned for itself. So we're good. All right, now suppose... We want a passband centered at 10 radians per second. So intuitively, we expect to apply um, expect to apply KF is equal to 10. So to do that, we just scale stuff as we know how to do. So R new is just equal to well. It stays the same, right? Um, and then L nu is just going to get divided by 10. So we have 0 0.1. And then the capacitor nu, well, what happens with that? Um, same deal, right? We're doing a frequency shift, or fre excuse me, a frequency um, scaling. So we end up with 0 0.1 uh, farads as well. Noting here that for frequency scaling, we just divide both of these by that scale factor and leave this part alone. For magnitude, it's a different story, right? We do something different to each one of these and it also magnitude would apply to the resistor, okay? If you don't remember that, just go back to uh, a couple lectures ago. I believe it's lecture 25. Okay, so having that now, what we end up with is the following. We have omega naught nu, fortunately is at 10 radians per second, which you know, we kind of expected. Um, this comes from one over the square root of one tenth times one tenth. You you can do the rest. Uh, the bandwidth here is equal to one over R new, but that's the same as R old, right? C new, not to be confused with the jet ski. Uh, that's equal to 10 times one tenth. So this actually shifted a little bit, right? Our bandwidth actually uh, got bigger. As in our... Uh, Omega shifted. So our omega shifted over to the right, yeah, because we were at, if we're looking at log scale here, make these even. This is omega equal 1, omega equal 10. We shifted down, and our band pass looked, right, it was a, it was a band pass, I'm sorry, a band width of, wow, that was kind of goofy. All right, there we go. It's a band width of like point, uh, 0 0.1, right? But as I move down here, it's got to look the same, right? Pretend it looks the same. Work with me here. Okay, it looks the same on a log scale, right? So if it's not on a log scale, what does this look like? Aha. Uh -huh. So it would look like this. This guy would be really narrow. And then dot, 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 dot. All right. It's a lot bigger. I'm exaggerating here, but you get the idea. Uh, the magnitude, by the way would still be about the same height here. So here we go there. So 
that's where we're at, omega equals 10. So this is what it actually looks like in reality, uh, normal scale here. But really, this is how the frequency space tends to work out nicely uh, for us. So we tend to see things in this, in this log-scaled fashion. Okay, and then finally, let's examine the Q factor. So if this is true, then really from a heuristic standpoint, nothing has changed, right? We've just moved down the line. So I wouldn't expect anything to really be different about the quality of my bandpass filter. And as a matter of fact... What do you know? It's exactly the same. So that is really awesome. That our scaling of frequency hasn't impacted our bandpass uh, filter characteristics really at all. It's just moved it into a new place and it's behaving as it should. Okay. It's behaving in a um, complementary way to how it was before. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. I told you we get to some cool stuff. This is where it's cool. Now, I know it's kind of confusing and scary, and it's new, and a lot of this stuff is like, why are you throwing so many damn letters at me? Um, stop it. <laughs> It looks like that alphabet soup I cooked up in lecture 10, right? Um, but honestly, guys, once you get used to this world, it's eye-opening. And you start to see everything in a new way. I can't tell you how I even thought about um, things like music before I started thinking about things in the frequency domain. Or how I thought about images before. Because... Once you start to see things in terms of a frequency type of space, your whole world transforms around you. Everything you look at and, a, and all the data you collect now becomes, it has this duality in a totally different space that you can now manipulate and make it look the way you want it to. And you can make it do things and perform different tasks for you. And that's really the magic of being an electrical engineer. And that's what really drew me to this field from mathematics. Because you can do so much with math. But the real application of something is what makes it magical. And man, are we doing some magic here today. Because we've just effectively preserved all this bandpass characteristic um, on a log scale, okay? Which is pretty neat. All right. So enough, enough blubbering. So in the homework, what I want you guys to focus on primarily is just the stuff for quizzes and exams. Um, this stuff is great for practical work. Okay. I think that these are pulled more or geared more towards the laboratory type of stuff. Um, as a theoretical laboratory type of question, I encourage you to attempt them and work through the solutions, but this is the main focus, uh, for our purposes in this, this part of the course. Okay. Um, I, I have to be honest here. Um, a lot of this stuff in here, I haven't really been touching on as much with the practical application. Part of that is I don't want to, you know, steer you guys down the wrong path of, uh, things that I don't, I'm not as familiar with, to be honest. Um, being kind of new to the field of electrical engineering and having more of a math background, I need this stuff, or we're doing a lot of manipulations. Um, so this is the, the pool that we're going to swim in primarily in this course. However, comma, that's not to say that you shouldn't also work at this stuff too. And, but, uh, but yeah, don't worry too much about this upper section up here, okay? Just focus on these guys. And these are very similar to what we did today. All right. Uh, oh, no homework next time. That's nice. Oh, great. This crap is back in two lectures. Okay, that's... Okay, well, we'll see you guys uh, next time, and uh, hope you all had a happy fourth. I guess it'll probably be like two week, two and a half weeks ago at this point, <laughs> but yeah. All right, uh, let me write up the homework thing here. So focus on problem three, okay? That's about it. Okay, thanks all. I'll talk to you later. Bye.